Hjertelig velkommen til et nytt program her på Israel-kanalen. I dette programmet så skal vi møte en som har tjenestegjort på Gazastripa, det er nemlig Doron Kaidar. Han har vært presentert for våre serier på Israel-kanalen tidligere, den gangen i egenskap av at han er leder for en organisation som heter Cry for Zion. Den organisationen de arbeider altså for at jøder og kristne skal ha fulle rettigheter oppe på tempelhøyden. Doran Kaidar han blev med oss en hel dag under den solidaritetsturen som Erik Selle arrangerte i februar og som jeg var så heldig å være med på. Og første stopp det er Nova-festivalen. So I'm standing here with uh, Doran Kaidar. Uh, you are a soldier in the reserve forces and you came here on what day? We came here I would say about uh, a day or two after the attack. Um, we were the first reserve unit that I'm aware of that uh, was able to get geared up and ready before even uh, a lot of the military was ready. And so we were the, one of the first ones to arrive here, not to engage with the enemy because my particular unit is not a, it's not a, uh, what we call a direct action unit. Um, so we actually had to hold ourselves back. My commander had a very hard decision to not engage with the terrorists so that we can continue to do the job that we actually do which is a very specialty job in the military but we did arrive here about a day or two later so there were still bodies cars and this is the site of the nova festival this is the nova festival this is where ground zero of the attacks on the 7th of october happened this was a military closed area there were no civilians when we got here at least not alive and uh, it was a horror film. It's worse than a horror film, honestly, because no horror film could uh, depict what we had to witness on these grounds where over 300 people were murdered in cold blood and tortured and raped, etc. So after seeing what you saw here, uh, how do you feel yourself? <laughs> I'm still processing it, to be honest. Uh, yesterday was my first day of official leave of service. I'm still in what we call out process, processing out of our uh, service. Um, we're still going to have to go see uh, the shrinks, you know, for mental process, uh, post-traumatic uh, stress, and so on. So um, what I can tell you is what I've been battling for the past four months is a pure rage for what I had witnessed happen to my people. Just a rage, an internal fire of anger, of um, this is not right. This is an, the most unjust evil that's been executed to my people since the Holocaust. And that's a lot saying from somebody who's been fighting in war since 2003. I've been in every one of Israel's uh, major wars. Nothing like this has ever, 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 ever uh, happened to us. Not in my modern warfare of fighting or in the older since the founding of the State of Israel. Nothing like this has ever happened. Nothing. So when you think back on the atrocities that you witnessed here, yeah. what can you say about it? What can I say is that people came here to party in the middle of a nature reserve to have fun to enjoy life and their lives were taken from them in an instant by by enraged terrorists who crossed the border by the hundreds and they came here and they murdered people in cold blood they raped every person man woman they tortured everyone almost everyone the lucky ones got murdered instantly by just being shot to death some were burnt alive. The most horrible things happened to the people here. So what I can say is that what happened here is essentially genocide. This is a genocide. The world's talking about the military committing genocide in the Gaza Strip. I've been fighting in Gaza for the past four months. My last operations as of a few days ago were in Khan Yunus, in the very heart of where the war is happening right now. I have not committed any war crimes. I have not committed any genocide. None of my men have, and none of any of the forces in my immediate vicinity. 
So what they're talking about, I haven't witnessed and I haven't seen. What I witnessed and saw here, that was genocide. That was baseless murder of innocent civilians who happened to be collected in one place and made it easy for the terrorists to just murder all these people. While we're fighting a very technical war in Gaza to get the terrorists and not hurt any of the civilians. That's the difference. Yeah, because if you really wanted to wipe out the Palestinians, you could have done it in a few days. In a few days. We wouldn't waste four months of our time, of our energy, of my men. I've had over 20 guys killed around me in one day. I think it was about 25, 26, give or take, that died instantly in one day. Why do we need that? Why do I have to endure losing the loss of life of my men like this when I could just have the Air Force send rockets and bombs to level the Gaza Strip. That would be the right thing to do, so to speak. That's what the United States did in Japan. But we don't do that. We don't do the so-called right thing of hitting the enemy in such a way that he's just going to give up. Instead, we perform operations that are very uh, like a surgeon, <laughs> weeding out the tumor, but it, the, the costs for our lives is very high and it you know it's, it's something that can be argued is it worth it is it not is it right is it not i don't know but at least i know i can sleep at night knowing i didn't kill any innocents in gaza period that's something i can live with at least but living with the casualties of my men being killed that's the hard weight that every one of us has to carry though that's that's the biggest hurt and all the innocents that were killed here and uh, in the other communities here in the Gaza Strip, communities. When, you, when we hear about these atrocities, uh, it has been said that uh, the terrorists that behave in an inhuman way, like animals, but you have another take on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, calling them animals is a degradation to the animal kingdom. Um, what they performed here was demonic. It was demonic, it was a pure evil. Pure evil like you've never seen. Um, and I really pray and hope nobody ever has to witness that pure evil. But it was not animalistic. Animals treat other animals more humanely than what these terrorists did here. It was demonic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We drew also in on Kibbutz and Kvarasa. Och då vi hade glädjen av att träffa Knesset medlem Sharon Haskell. Sharon Haskell har varit medlem av Knesset sedan 2015, först för Likud och nu sitter hon där för nytt hopp. Hon var med oss under hela besöket på Kvarasa och med sitt brännande engagemang satte det ett extra präg på besöket där. Um, if you hear loud explosions, don't worry. Okay, usually it's from our side heading there. Um, if you hear any noise of like uh, called Tseva Adom, okay, everybody just go on the ground, put your hands on your head, okay, wherever you are. If we have a cut, because the distance is just a few seconds, how much? 14 seconds. 14 seconds to take cover, okay? okay. Uh, so wherever you see, you just flat down. If you think that within 14 seconds you can reach, you see this little building. Okay, this is like a safe room, a shelter. So if it is in reach, we just head straight in there and we go in until the alarm goes <laughs> off, okay? This is just measures for security. Sharon Haskell, uh, in Norway, the Norwegian government has declared extensive support for UNERVA. What is your view about this organization? Well, it is very sad because sending more funds to UNRWA doesn't help a single Palestinian. On the contrary, they help Hamas, who works against the Palestinians. UNRWA is this organization that is parallel to the Palestinian government. It gives them an education, welfare, housing, up to the street cleaning as well. That's why it's important, because it is like a government. But what they don't realize or they know but they actually ignore is that Hamas has completely taken over this organization okay most UNRWA workers they're either Hamas or Hamas first family members that's a fact um, so Hamas is actually controlling it 
Now, Hamas, when the humanitarian aid is coming, it's not distributing it to the Palestinian. You see the videos and the images of Hamas shooting children and civilians who are trying to get aid. You see, for example, tents who were contributed by uh, the Emiratis or the Qataris. They're sold in the market for 2,000 shekels. A bag of flour is being sold for 200 shekels. It's meant to be distributed for free. How come it's being sold? And it is because Norway is giving it to Hamas. Hamas is pocketing this money to continue to perpetuate this conflict. And the Gazan citizens who are really poor and can't afford that, they don't receive it. So trying to ignore this problem doesn't solve it. It only perpetuates it and it makes a worse, uh, 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 a worse outcome anyway. Um, what really needs to happen is that Norway actually ask the United Nations, for example, OCHA, okay, to spread its umbrella and bring it to Gaza so that real people from the international community who have a lot of experience working in disastrous area, in war zone, like in Syria and Afghanistan and Sudan, can spread that humanitarian umbrella in Gaza so that Hamas can't put their hands on it. Um, the international community and international workers are very well experienced in those cases. And if they did it with millions of refugees and very dangerous war zones all around the world, they can do that in Gaza as well. And you know who will receive this aid? Real Gazans, real people who are in desperate need of humanitarian aid and not Hamas. Well, the Norwegian government says that they don't support terrorism. They just support the civilians, the humanitarian aid. Isn't that just a disguise for the real uh, where the money is going? I'll tell you what. It's easy to put a blindfold or to really uh, uh, turn a blind eye on a situation. A lot of the times it's easy. Because, you know, you'll say, OK, I'm sending humanitarian aid to Iraq. I'm only ignoring that I'm sending it to ISIS, okay? And so you feel good in your heart that you send the money, you send the products there to Iraq, but you're ignoring the fact that the people who need it didn't receive it, but the terrorist organization who is actually holding this entire population as hostage is stealing that and is pocketing the, that money. So the humanitarian crisis is still there. You didn't solve it. And it is about time that not just the Norwegian, but I have to say even here in Israel, unfortunately, for too long, we have turned a blind eye on many things. Like, for example, here straight on the fences, Hamas was training. We ignored it because we thought Hamas was the turn. They were uh, practicing paragliding straight on the border here. The community here that you see that was butchered, they warned the IDF about it, but we believed, we thought that Hamas is the terror. We couldn't be more wrong. And so it's about time that all the governments, all leadership, stop, to, stop turning a blind eye and deal with the facts, deal with the reality, solve the real problems, and don't just put a Band-Aid on something. Some politicians in Norway have asked the question, why do we support the pay for slay, the payment to the, the terrorists? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer they get is that the, they have a promise from the Palestinians that our money, the Norwegian's money, is not supporting this. Uh, that, I, I'm sorry, but that's BS. Um, the money that you send to the Palestinian Authority goes directly to that. More so, that massacre that you've seen here, we have captured quite a few Nukhba terrorists, Hamas terrorists, who are right now in Israeli prison. You know who's going to pay their salary for the rest of their life for burning, raping, mutilating? It's the Norwegian people who are going to pay for their salaries. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ja, det var alltså klart tale om vad han mener om de norske politikerne og deres forsøk på å dekke over den langvarige finansieringen av de arabiske terroristenes forsøk på å utslette Israel. Vi endte denne dagen i Tel Aviv, hvor jeg fikk en avsluttende samtale med Doron Keidar. We have been together with you today and learned a lot about the situation after October 7. And you have been fighting there. 
How many days have you been actually been fighting the Hamas terrorists? Um, my battalion has been called up since day one. So essentially since October 7th till today, uh, it's been 128 days, I think, if I do the math right, uh, that I've been fighting with my unit. We have just been released now on a temporary leave and we might get called back, I don't know. But uh, that's how much we've been fighting uh, up to now. So over four months. The experiences that you have had, uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? The experiences is basically going into the heart of hell every night, doing operations, missions, uh, very important missions to help the military continue its war effort in the Gaza Strip. Uh, right now, the last place I've been in is Khan Yunus. Uh, we've also slept there. So um, the experience is waking up to explosions, going to sleep to explosions all around you. Air Force is uh, making uh, either an airstrike or the uh, special sapper units are blowing up tunnels all around us, or the tanks are shooting uh, enemy, or the artillery is shooting an enemy. So really it's living in on, on edge every night. And even in our operations, uh, we're in a Humvee that's unprotected, or basically a Hummer. If you want, you can Google it if you don't know what that is. So it's an open Jeep where the tanks sometimes come right next to your face like this and the tanks can't see you because we operate in absolute darkness and we have some very close co uh, calls we've actually even been hit by some big vehicles so a lot of my men have been wounded 90 percent of my unit have been wounded and hurt actually from ourselves not from the enemy uh, just by carrying out these very complex operations so it's been basically living and operating in a very intense environment a very dangerous environment. Um, over 20 men lost in one night, just 100, 200 meters from you by the enemy. Uh, it's very tense, very tense. And so of course, uh, it's not something that you experience when you go sip a coffee at uh, Starbucks, you know, or uh, go to work and uh, whatever it is you do. It's a very different world. Uh, with all this, uh battle actions taking place yep. how do you cope how can you get rest and sleep I haven't had a good night's sleep yet but um, I don't know we still haven't spoken to the psychologist that's part of my out process uh, that my unit's gonna go through um, so obviously we need psychological help um, obviously we need uh, physical help so that means getting uh, vitamins getting exercise again because when you're doing very uh, uh, tense uh, operational uh, missions, you don't get rest, and you're always wearing uh, over uh, 60 pounds, or was it over 30 kilos of gear every night? So that wears you down. And so it's having to recuperate, heal up, um, do all the things that we need to do, and hopefully we get, can get some sleep, <laughs> and uh, that's part of that process. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, something I got to work on we all have to work on all the guys that have been out there uh, do you get to sleep at night in, in my in my uh, in our operations yeah no we don't get to sleep at night we sleep in the day <laughs> so all of our missions have been conducted in the nighttime some missions in the day but the normal standard is that we operate at night uh, so actually when I operate I see the Sun go down and then I see it come up. That's been the norm. And that means uh, going to sleep as the sun's coming up. That means uh, waking up, getting something quick to eat, and then getting your gear in order and getting ready for another up. So that's been the routine for us, which obviously affects our sleep and our uh, physical and mental uh, stability and what have you. And uh, so yeah, I need to build back a routine of sleeping at night and waking up in the morning. So now we are on day 130 after October 7th. Yeah. And still there are hostages still in Gaza. Yeah. Uh, the fighting is still going on. Hamas is not uh, uh, destroyed yet. What do you think about the continuation of the actions there? So my personal opinion is that uh, what we have been doing and we've been building this momentum 
in our battalion alone and other units that have been operating with us together. There are many special units all around us. And um, everyone's doing their mission in such a way that we are increasing the pressure on the enemy. We're closing in on the enemy. We're destroying more of their infrastructure. And that is why right now Hamas is crying for a ceasefire. And in my opinion is that we should give them anything but a ceasefire. It means that what we've been doing in the hard work, blood, sweat, tears that we've been shedding has been giving us good fruit. And so what we need to do is we need to press on. We need to put the enemy farther in desperation so that they will release the over 130 hostages. It's 134, I believe, right now. Um, and we need to release the hostages and we need to eliminate the terrorist infrastructure to where there's not one rocket being fired towards Israel. Rockets, four months in, are still being fired towards Tel Aviv. Uh, not Jerusalem that I've seen uh, as of late, but in Kigat Shemunap in the north. Uh, again, that's Hezbollah, it's a different uh, enemy, but still, we're being attacked and we're being fired at nonstop four months into the beginning of the war that Hamas started. And that's also an important fact. Hamas started this, I don't want to fight. I am a warrior, but I don't want to fight unless I have to. None of my men want to fight unless we have to. And that's the reality is they have pushed us to where we need to defend our people and restore and bring back our captives. And that's our mission. That's what we want to do. And I believe that's what the government needs to decide and help us do our job because we're doing our job and we're being very successful. And we just need to be given the green light to keep doing it. I know the United States is putting pressure on our government. The United States isn't here. The United States doesn't have 134 hostages. They're being raped. They're being tortured. They're being malnutrition in Gaza. They don't see the light of day. They don't have that. We do. So unless they're willing to put their civilians under that kind of reality, then they don't have a say in this, in my opinion, or any other country, for that matter of fact. It looks like uh, the the war in in the, in Gaza is coming closer to an end, uh, in and the fighting is in the very south. Yes. Uh, do you think you will succeed in in um, destroying Hamas? If we are given the green light, absolutely. It's not even a question in my mind. Not a question in my mind. We just need to be given the green light. Let the operators, let the warriors, let the soldiers, let the intelligence community, because it's a full package, right? So we have people from, and, and our families. Our families are the biggest heroes. Our wives, our mothers, our fathers that are letting us fight this war. They're the biggest heroes, and they are all willing to keep uh, enduring another day, another week, another month, whatever, however much it takes, as long as the hostages are returned and that they're safe and security for the Israeli civilians here that live here. Yeah. So absolutely, if we're given the green lights, we have support from home and we have support from the operators, the soldiers who are out in the field. All of us are willing to push all the way through and see this thing through. Uh, right now you are relieved from the army. Uh, do you feel uh, like a release for that pressure or what, what is your feeling right now against that? Um, we just met with the victims or family members of the hostages at the center that we've been at. I do not feel a release. I feel like I want to go back and fight. After hearing a mother of a young man who's been held in Gaza for, for 130 days now of this recording, uh, I feel her hurt, I feel her pain. I think of my children, I have three. I think of them being in Gaza, what would I do? I wouldn't go on leave, I'd go back and fight. But unfortunately, it's not my decision to make. It's the military that has to make their decisions, their tactical reasonings to restore and bring us back to um, uh, conditioning and what have you. There's a whole process. But on a personal level, and I say any, and I'm speaking for all my men in my unit, every one of them would show up tomorrow if we were told, keep fighting and, and uh, for the causes that we're fighting for. Uh, and we would all show up. All of us, 100% of our men would show up. Um, but the case is we've been released for now and we're preparing for war, for the next stage of war actually for our particular unit. Um, and it's a, it's a miserable place to be in. 
you know, we want to we want to see this thing through all the way to the end. But, uh, you know, it's not my decision to make. Well, thank you very much, Tara. Thank you. Som du säkert förstår så gör den turen dypt intryck på mig. Och det att stå upp för Israel har blivit mycket mycket viktigare. Jag sätter en väldigt stor pris på all den stöd och uppmuntring som jag får. Och det är väldigt fint att få alla den tillbakemeldingen och se att det är väldigt många runt omkring i Norges land som faktiskt är goda Israels vänner. Tack för att du stöttar Israel kanalen och det arbete som vi gör genom dina donationer in på vår konto eller vid att du sender dina vipsgaver. Så tusen hjärtligt tack för det. Och ved det arbete, ved att vi får dessa pengar in så kan vi också göra ganska mycket mer och vara en välsignelse för Israel. Och ved att vi välsignar Israel så blir vi också välsignat själ. Och jag tänker att det är viktigt i den tid vi lever i, hvor vi ser regeringen faktiskt går emot det som Bibeln säger och motarbetar staten Israel. Så vi att vi kan vara en välsignelse för Israel så hoppas jag också att vi kan vara med och bringa välsignelse tillbaka igen till Norge. Tusen hjärtligt tack för att du har följt oss genom detta program och på gensyn igen nästa vecka. Tusen tack för det.